Hi, I'm Christina Hodge, Academic Curator and Collections Manager, and I'd like to introduce you to the Stanford University Archaeology Collections. So I am Christina Hodge. I'm the academic curator and collections manager for the Stanford University Archaeology Collections, which is an anthropological, archaeological um, group of uh, artifacts, artworks, material culture from all around the world. We've got about 100,000 objects. Our history goes back to the founding of the university itself, to the Stanford family, all the way up through uh, contemporary um, archaeology on Stanford's lands. And so we're quite a diverse collection and the exhibit and the stories you're going to hear uh, from the students really reflect that as well. So I'm going to start sharing my PowerPoint to just give a bit of an introduction to where this exhibit came from uh, and to the students themselves and kind of orient us. And then we'll go through and hear from the students individually to get some behind the scenes of their experiences in the class um, and what they'd really like our audience to know about the exhibit that they worked so hard on last spring, over the summer, and then all the way up until, you know, a few hours ago. So we're very excited to be sharing this with everybody now. So if you'll just give me a sec while I do the screen share a thing. Okay, so Women in the World, uh, virtual exhibit opening. All right, so welcome everybody again uh, to the virtual exhibit opening. Wanted to, even though we're virtual, start with a bit of a land acknowledgement, which we're really um, you know, normalizing as a practice here at Stanford, and you may have seen this in other places. So most of us, unless we are indigenous ourselves, perhaps on our homelands, we're a guest on indigenous lands of one sort or another. And so Stanford itself and where I'm talking to you from is in uh, Palo Alto. And so we're on the ancestral homelands of uh, Lone people. And um, Stanford has a very close relationship and wants to uh, acknowledge that we're on the ancestral land specifically of Muwekma Ohlone tribe, uh, which is uh, important to Muwekma people, um, other Ohlone people, and we in Stanford in general, and especially in uh, the SUAC collections who are caretakers of the material legacy, archaeological uh, materials from these lands, uh, very privileged and very aware of our partnership with Muwekma, and so have a special relationship uh, to these responsibilities and to the tribe itself with whom we work and really partner in caring for these materials. Um, so that's a, a background um, just to keep in mind if you're interested in learning more about native lands where you might be from. There's, uh, you can Google it very easily. There's a really useful resource called Native Land Digital. And so if you Google Native Land Digital, they've got an interactive map that'll really uh, help you do that. And so the archeology span collections, as I said, they're a global collection. And every year I teach a uh, class where we bring students in to work with the materials, which last year had to be a virtual class. Um, but one of the things, and one of the reasons we do this class uh, virtually um, is that even when we can't talk with the material or work with the materials is because we're always learning about the collections we do have. And one of the key aspects of this that I wanted to um, make sure to touch on is kind of background for the students speaking with you is this idea of uh, provenance. And so provenance, if you're familiar with museums, is the uh, history of where um, artifacts come from. It's the history of ownership. And in collections like ours, uh, there is a lot of different ways objects get into the museum, but not always a lot we know about it. And one of our responsibilities is to take that look backwards because for things to be used ethically today, we really wanna know how we got what we got. We don't wanna take anything for granted. And that means looking more carefully into the people involved in the acquisition of these materials, uh, researching their biographies, trying to figure out sort of who they were and what motivated them. And this is a question that we get from um, descendant communities, uh, originating community members, and from um, you know, researchers and other folks all the time. And so the idea of what is provenance, how do we figure it out, um, is something that is a really uh, important part of our work. And so what we did last year was recruit some uh, 16 students to help us with this research. 
And uh, among those students are the um, four that you're going to be hearing from today. Um, so yeah, Veronica's going through and showing you some of these slides, what work now looks like again in the Stanford Archaeology Collections, our welcome and acknowledgement slide, all the faces that I swear are smiling underneath their masks, working in the collections. Uh, and then um, the slide after that, if you go uh, to the next slide, Veronica um, is going to be this provenance slide. So that idea of you know where collections are from, you can see on this map, everything highlighted red, we need to know more about. And so this is where I'm at now, uh, just explaining the, uh, oh, sorry, next slide, please. Um, yes, thank you. Okay. So the inspirations for the Women in the World exhibit that we have going on right now. Um, one of them was a big project that just finished up during COVID. This was our wall-to-wall -wall inventory project. Veronica, uh, if you see the plaid shirt in this photo, um, was one of the folks working on this along with Sarah and Susie. And in their uh, work on the inventory project, they were finding um, not just what we have, uh, but they were starting to uh, get really interested in the people who brought it to us. And um, perhaps more than anything else, I wanted to highlight one of my inspirations for really making this a focus of last year's project. And this was the um, object that you see on the right, which is a really amazing Ainu robe from Hokkaido, Japan. And the Ainu are indigenous people of Hokkaido um, and that area in Japan. And that we had this at all intriguing. And then our inventory team, Sarah, Susie and Veronica looked at our records. You can see this yellow catalog card and saw that we received this in 1959 from a woman named uh, Miss Fujiko Imamura. And this also was really surprising to us. Um, knowing what we know about collections, we know that they were, uh, for a lot of their history, created by uh, privileged white people, both men and women. Um, but Fujiko Imamura, very intriguing name, went to search for her, found uh, that she was a Stanford alum from 1957, uh, 1959, uh, arrived in 1956, found this amazing photograph of her in the Stanford archives. And with this photograph of uh, this, you know, smiling, proud Stanford graduate, which should resonate with everyone here uh, related to um, either current students or reunion, um, really this solidified in my mind that we just needed to take the opportunity to learn more about the women who brought things to our collections. And so uh, next slide, please. So that was the genesis of the exhibit in the spring where I had the students um, sign up and basically in the museum cultures course each adopt uh, one of our women in provenance we've got about 45 and uh, but we focused on 16 for this exhibit uh, and then uh, next uh, slide please besides the class and all that research that you're going to hear about um, we also had another student elsa who's with us today who then took all of the quarters worth of archival research and critical thinking and discussion and finding images and thinking about how to organize an exhibit. And over the summer with uh, Veronica and I helped us figure out, all right, how to take that pile of information and organize it in a way to create a virtual exhibit uh, using the platform story maps. Um, and so that's uh, where I'm actually gonna turn it over to Elsa. Um, so if you want to uh, switch the focus to Elsa and then Veronica, if you hover over the bottom of the slide, you'll see um, exactly this is a screen recording. So you can just have it play as Elsa's talking and then pause it um, to pause on um, different uh, aspects of the um, design that Elsa is talking about. So yes. Elsa, why don't you go yes. ahead? I'm gonna Hi, mute can everyone hear me? Good. Okay. Yay. Um, so yeah, as Christina said, I worked with her and Veronica over the summer, basically choosing the layout for this exhibit. Um, as you can see, it's kind of like an endless scroll, but um, we wanted it to be like as accessible as possible and also convey as much information as we could. So each section is kind of divided into three parts. There's a bio, then there's the woman's life and all of her activities, which it focuses on her travel, which we had as a major theme of the exhibit um so as you can see here this is the bio you can jump between different women as the headers um and for some women we couldn't have their picture so we had an artifact instead um but yeah as you scroll down um 
scales go down and show you a map. Um, and as you continue to scroll, you can see how these women traveled across the world, um, which a lot of times coincided with their acquisition of artifacts, but not always. Um, and I would just like to note that most of these women were incredibly privileged, and that's the reason that they were able to travel so much. Um, for a lot of cases, uh, an average woman in this time period was not able to travel as much as these women did. Um, so that was an important thing. Um, yeah, and as you can see, you can zoom in on every picture and stuff like that um, to focus on the activities. Um, and we also focused on like the division. So the exhibit is divided into four parts, um, four categories of women. So there's women who traveled because of marriage, women who traveled because of scholarship, women who traveled because of professionalism, so like their jobs. And also we had to create an et cetera category simply because there were some women who we did not have enough information about, um, which is unfortunate, but is also incredibly common when studying women. Um, so this is continuing to go through. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, and then the other section will focus on the artifacts. Um, a lot of the artifacts come from different places in the women's travels. So I would just like to note that the provenance of these objects, the women themselves are not usually not the first case. Fujiko Imamura, as we mentioned, was like one of the few examples where it like might have been her own object. But a lot of the cases, it was like a native collection. Um, here we're looking at like um, indigenous Filipino artifacts. So obviously the provenance goes beyond the women who acquired it. And unfortunately, we don't have as much information about like the original creators of the objects as we'd like. But I think that's just something important to know. <laughs> so that's basically it for me. All right, thank you, Elsa. Um, was there anything you wanted to uh, share about just the process of your design too? I know that um, working with the Story Map platform uh, afforded certain opportunities and also certain challenges, and that um, when you're designing both physical exhibits and virtual exhibits, there are kind of limitations to one's vision that you come up with. And I know we, we worked a lot um, through that to figure out ways where we could use story maps. Um, and you were really creative in thinking about ways to use story maps to convey that idea of privilege and travel um, and the complexities and nuances that come through with that in women's lives. Yeah, I guess I'll say this much. Um, the one thing about story maps, which is really helpful, especially for an exhibit that's seen like this around travel is, as in the name, it's very map focused. So um, as you can tell, the, um, the, the part about the women's activities is a guided map tour. So you can basically scroll down, but you can also click any like little dot and it'll take you to like that activity and like why she was there at that moment. Um, and then also like see the yeah, those, if you click like eight or something, you would be able to cut to the eighth one instead of just going through the scroll. But um, also for the objects, there's a map, it places where that object was found on the map or its original space. So stuff like that, I wanted to emphasize like the, the real provenance of where these objects were from rather than when they were acquired. All right, great, thank you. Yeah, and so that was a way, um, as Elsa was saying, story maps is storytelling through maps. And one of the main things we always try to do in our exhibits is not take for granted that objects belong in museums, really question how they got there and visualizing how they got there um, is one piece of this and then visualizing how the people who got them actually were circulating themselves in a way was another really important piece of it um, as we will hear from our next speaker uh, who is going to be dahlia hernandez who as elsa said there's this um, we put our women into uh, four categories based on travel and the privileging and the experiences they had uh, through travel. Uh, and so Dahlia is sort of in our first section here. Um, when you hit the exhibit homepage, there's the introduction. And then there's this uh, marriage and mobility section that you click on that tile and it brings you to this section. Uh, and then Dahlia, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about your um, example of a woman who really through marriage sort of saw more of the world and came to uh, collect and connect with us through these objects that she had. Hi, my name is Dahlia. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, yeah, so as Dr. Hodge was saying, my woman was uh, Jean Margaret Strick uh, Armstrong Marshall. And when I actually started this project, I did not realize that she had remarried. So uh, in the process of like researching Jean, I 
found a lot about her relationship as like it related to men in her life. So a lot of the like original documents that I was given mentioned her father and her growing up uh, like under this like doctor. And then eventually it just mentioned her husband who was like this very famous lawyer. But she was always like uh, presented in this like relationship with like the men in her life. And so uh, it was very like eye-opening to see that a lot of the stories that we like consider like very important to ourselves might only be passed like orally because she was very much like kept under the wing of the men in her life. And she had like passing interests in art, but it was very much awarded as a result of the men that she knew and the men she married. And so she did travel a lot. She was born in China and she had a very strong interest in Asian art. But a lot of her acquisitions and uh, uh, like collections weren't properly like explained in the process of researching them. So it was just very eye-opening to see the way that women were like categorized during this time period and even within like Stanford's own collections. Yeah, um, as you can see kind of, uh, she traveled to China and then she kind of resided in the Bay Area. I'm, she kind of like, I don't know, she was very interesting. She went to San Jose State University. She participated pretty widely in a lot of those like sororities and she had a lot of like wealth and privilege, but she was still very much deemed under like her relationship with men. And I don't know, it was just very interesting for me to see. I had never like participated in uh, records or data collection at all before. And it was very eye-opening. <laughs> Yeah, um, I don't know if it wants to get passed on or if anyone has any questions they'd like to interject with, but her collections for Stanford were specifically like Mesoamerican, did not state how she acquired these or where they exactly came from. Um, again, going back to the questions of how are Stanford's collections eth ethically produced or consumed? Yeah, not a lot of information was spread. Great, thank you so much, Dahlia. Yeah, so those those points that you're bringing up, um, I think you know we're focusing on Marshall here, but they really characterize women in this and many of the sections. So we put the women in these sections, but there are overarching themes um, that you'll be hearing about, and the idea of how to uh, get at women when they are, um, you know, their records are. Uh, subsumed under the names of men in their lives and what is remarkable about them or notable about them what's worth archiving or recording uh, is often associated with the men in their lives um, and so the role of us looking at artifacts has been a sideways um, portal to get at women's lives and an access point um, that i think is maybe underutilized right looking for museum donations really opened up a lot of um, information to us in our process that, you know, maybe if you're looking at women, you wouldn't necessarily know or think to look at museums for their roles as docents, donors, um, volunteers, or whatever it might be. Uh, and so I think that that's another legacy um, of the collections as well, uh, as well as the frustration that you heard from Dahlia, where sometimes we just don't know, but we, we are going to keep trying to find out uh, both about the women and about where these materials they have came from. All right, so thank you very much, Dahlia. Um, so the next section in the exhibit uh, is the professional pathways section. Uh, and so this is a group of women who, um, you know, more or less privileged, uh, also all um, white uh, settler or immigrant um, Euro-American, so not coincidental there. Uh, also, all, a lot of them very highly educated, um, so not coincidental there. But uh, the, this link of travel and the experiences of travel really came through strongly. And it was through their professions that this group of women really saw different places in the world. Um, they didn't always collect, you know, they weren't professional people who were studying what they were collecting necessarily that we received, but their professions, you know, they were really going to places we wouldn't have expected at time periods we wouldn't have expected. 
And so this was a really um, wonderful way to learn about you know, some different geopolitical issues in the 20th century US and also just really uh, get more insight into where collections come from and how women shaped our uh, collections. So uh, with that, Sydney, why don't you go right ahead? Hi everyone, my name is Sydney DeBerry and my woman that I was given to research was Mrs. Hilda Hempel Heller. And she graduated from Stanford with a biology degree with an emphasis in bacteriology and zoology. And similar to also like the women in the marriage category, her marriage also had a great influence on her voyages and the expeditions she went on through her career. She was married to Edmund Heller. And through this marriage and also just through her career and ties to other scientists, she went on multiple expeditions with the Field Museum and also the American Museum of Natural History. And this again is a common obstacle that a lot of my classmates also faced. And through my research of Heller, a lot of the information I found was through her husband and going through his expedition journals and what he was writing down concerning what he was finding. And then he would credit his wife or maybe like a picture of an animal that he found in Africa. But she was very involved in those expeditions while going on expeditions for her own career. She very frequently visited um, Peru and also went on um, a research fellowship in throughout Europe. And yeah, and what I was drawn to, uh, I was drawn to Mrs. Hilda Hempel Heller because of her career path and how it coincided with, with what I wanted to do. She was very involved in like museum education and giving back to museums. And that is career path that I too want to follow. And just to have the opportunity to research behind the scenes of museums like American Museum of Natural History, which is a museum I'm quite familiar with and I've interned with. So just to have the opportunity to see what was going on as that you know, museum was being developed and objects and animals were being collected. And the fact that she was a very big part of that, it was just so interesting to find and, you know, to read her story and learn more about her. And I know, like, as I was researching the objects she donated to Stanford, there was little information on that. And I just had to come up with almost theories of how she acquired the objects and donated them to Stanford, one of them being through Edmund Heller acquiring this uh, this Tahitian basket during his travels and then giving it to um, his wife. And then eventually through their divorce, she could have donated to Stanford as kind of like releasing that part of her life, or she could have acquired the object herself. I did find record of her spending quite a lot of time in Hawaii, which would put her in the relative area of where she could have acquired this basket and then by her own accord donated it to Stanford. And it was just like, you know, very, again, like eye opening to see the fact that, you know, this woman was highly educated and had her own accolades that she produced herself. Yet any information you want to find, you have to go through Edmund Heller or you find scarce information online. Like it, it was a very frustrating process, but it was worth it just, to, you know, to just to learn more about this woman and just, you know, give her the voice that she deserves. You know, she did. She was published in a lot of highly accredited journals and she was very passionate about her work. And that was like the most interesting fact that I found about Heller was actually her death certificate because that was one of the pathways that we were told to look through to find more information about our women. And I couldn't find anything. And then I found this um, death certificate and it was actually on one of her voyages to Peru doing her research is where she passed away. And I don't know her final resting place, but I do think she still might be in Peru because there's no evidence of her coming back to. Um, but I just felt like that really embodied who she was as a woman and how serious she took her work and how passionate she was. And I found letters between her and another scientist, Watson Davis, and just to see her passion, but also her insecurities, too, through her letters. Um, that scientist Watson Davis was kind of convincing her to continue writing and continue sharing her findings with the world. And she felt as if no one wanted to, or no one would be interested. And, you know, it was just so interesting to finally like give her that spotlight and learn more about, you know, such an incredible woman.
All right, wonderful. Thank you so much, Sydney. Um, yeah, so again, some of these themes continuing. And then also, I think Sydney's example with Hilda um, Heller, that idea of, you know, finding the personhood and the nuance and the complexity in the records of museums uh, can be really difficult, but really worthwhile and uh, illuminating when you are able to do that. Uh, and I know that our uh, next group of women, our next speaker uh, has more um, about that as well. Uh, so our next section in the exhibit, the next group of women uh, are those who were traveling for their scholarship. And so what we received from them is actually directly related to their identities, to their contributions and self-fashioning as scholars sort of in and of, you know, in and of themselves in their own right. And so we are um, privileged enough to have those uh, materials from, you know, in some cases, uh, ancient originating communities uh, with contemporary descendants. And then in other cases, materials that the women made themselves uh, as part of their archaeological scholarship. Uh, so um, we're going to be hearing from Sophie next, uh, sharing one of uh, these women's stories, uh, Stanford, Stanford professor's uh, story. Yeah, hi. So I'm Sophie Calcott, uh, and I did my research on Hazel D. Hansen. What really drew me to Hansen at first was just uh, a lot of similarities I saw between myself and her. We're both from San Mateo, California, same hometown. She studied classics and archaeology at Stanford. I do medieval history and archaeology, so kind of two sides of the same coin. But then she went off to get a MA and PhD here at Stanford, and she did a lot of archaeological research over in Greece, which is where all of her objects are from. Uh, and I found, you know, her very like her specific work at Stanford very interesting. She she wrote a lot about specifically one uh, island in Greece, one place in Greece, Skyros, where her work there gave her honorary Greek citizenship, you know, by the Greek government. And she was given honors by the government of Skyros itself for her archaeological work there. And, you know, she was writing guidebooks for their museum. Uh, she, you know, was the sole provider for a Greek war orphan over in Greece. She was very, very, very much involved in this community. Uh, we also have a lot of information about her, or certainly more information than we have about the other two women that were just talked about. So there was a, really a lot to get into there. And so one of the constraints I had, you know, writing these pieces about her was deciding what we could and couldn't include just because, you know, there's some really interesting tidbits, stuff about her declaring, you know, she is never getting married because at the time when she was a professor at Stanford, if she were to date and or marry someone in her same field at Stanford, she would like have to forfeit her position. She could no longer be a professor if she married another classics or archaeology professor. This also comes at the heels of a presumably romantic relationship with a much older man uh, while she was studying in Greece, who, according to one of her friends, was directing uh, digs with the British Museum the year she was born. Uh, and so, you know, something may have happened there that colored her view of working professionally with other people in this field, uh, her, her relationships there. Uh, she also had a lot of, you know, conflict with the Stanford Faculty Club, where women weren't allowed to be members, and she, you know, ardently advocated for the to be members, started, you know, a women luncheon club for women uh, faculty and staff who couldn't be in the faculty club, uh, and was generally, you know, making strides and making a name for herself, even when, you know, institutional setbacks would suggests that she couldn't really be doing a lot of these things. And kind of to tail end that, I really like that the objects she has here at Stanford, and there's over a thousand of them, uh, are all very focused on the daily life of particularly women. You have spindle worlds and loom weights and things that generally ancient Greek women would be using. Uh, and then the final object was actually gifted by one of her former students in her name after her death, uh, which is meant to uh, you know, the Lakitas, the oil flask is coming up right now uh, to pour oil on dead bodies and respect them after they have died. Uh, this general sense of she was invested in the daily lives of normal people 
And that investment clearly showed in her work at Stanford in how she fought for other women in her position and then in how she was viewed by her students who would come back and donate something she would have liked in her name. So I think she's a really great woman and I'm very excited to you know, get her out there and get other people uh, learning about her. All right, thank you so much, Sophie. Um, yeah, I think that, right, uh, again, there's more, more information about the professional women, more information uh, that we could find about Hazel Hansen, who was closely related to our collections and, you know, our own community, a Stanford uh, alumnus and a Stanford professor, um, and that also, you know, that question of what, you know, as we're trying to come give complexity to women's lives, what makes it into an exhibit, what doesn't, um, and that these are whole people and complicated people, and we're reminded of it with some folks, and then with other folks, we, we can't quite get there in the same way, but hopefully um, the, the lesson carries over uh, everyone that we're looking at when we're thinking about uh, their motivations, their relationships, and um, all of those things as well. So the last section of the exhibit, uh, actually, I'm going to come back around to where I started with uh, Fujiko Imamura. Um, and so just to give a little bit of information about this. Um, so the last section of our exhibit uh, is called Women in Progress. And this is a section where, uh, unlike everybody you just heard from, we were very, we, including students and staff, all of us, uh, you know, pulling together, were very limited in what we could find out about these women. And so for them, as it says here, it was really their collections that are a major part of their legacy. So the objects we have are the main entry point and sort of the main um, piece of their self-determination, right? They don't, you know, acquired these things. They, these things were important to them. They donated them to Stanford and we know about it now. Um, it is not coincidental that Fujiko and uh, our other um, suspected woman of color, the only two we know of, uh, everybody else is settler colonial uh, white donors, they both fall into this category. Um, they were both international uh, and the ways that um, uh, different kinds of identities can compound each other and uh, get in the way of learning about people and really reflect uh, prejudices and reflect um, different kinds of hierarchies that they lived through the way that solidifies in archives. Uh, and even with our best efforts, we're not quite where we want to be yet uh, with some of these women. Um, and so that's the in progress part. Um, it's true for everybody in the exhibit as well, but we know there's especially work to do here. Uh, and so knowing Fujiko came to Stanford in the 1950s, right? She, um, as it's going through here, uh, she received international, a uh, very competitive international scholarships to come here as a Japanese woman, uh, not that long after World War II, and was able to come here to study education. Uh, the student newspapers did interviews with her. They were really interested in her perspectives on Stanford life, on what America was like versus Japan, on Stanford men and dating. Um, so there's some that we get with her. But then there's also really big questions, right? That beautiful um, I knew coat and belt set that she gave, we're not sure how she obtained it from the indigenous people. And so that's another mark here that I wanted to call out, that next step back in provenance, where we wanna connect these individual women with the indigenous communities, originating communities, figure out you know, how they got what they got that they then passed on to us. That's a really tricky step and that's a next step. Uh, so that's part of the in progress is really doing more to um, amplify other experiences that are connected with these objects, other relationships that these objects have, but just coming at these women and finding out so much about uh, what were previously, almost all of them were just as you saw at the beginning, right? Names typed up on a card. And uh, you know, if there's any message that I think I and the students would uh, kind of share, it's that, again, don't take things for granted in museums. And when you're looking at these provenance statements, um, think a bit more deeply, right? A provenance statement is not enough to really understand what's going on with museum collections. And I feel really privileged that the students 
today said yes uh, to come and talk to you about uh, these women and also the students in the class helped us uh, with all of the work that we did. Um, so Veronica, if you would go maybe to the next slide. So just to share, so that's the content of the exhibit, but just to share some other components of it, uh, for those of you who might be interested, there is a resources page, uh, resources for educators page. And so this is where um, we have a little bit more of uh, content in terms of, you know, the background, big picture stuff, historical context, like those I was just talking about, thinking about how these women were empowered and disempowered. Uh, thinking about relationships with colonizer and colonized. All of that is, is percolating in their stories, in their travels. And so further readings here are also ways to get at some of those uh, questions. And um, after that, uh, there's a section of discussion prompts, thinking about primary documents, thinking about um, you know, finding women in archives, thinking about whose voices are and are not being amplified in museums in general, even in our own exhibit. All of these questions came from the reflections that the students themselves wrote for the class, the curatorial reflections. And so you'll find a reflection from every student, uh, all 17 students, at the bottoms of those other pages. So in each section of women, if you scroll all the way down, you can go through and hear individually from each of our students um, about their women, about themselves, which I think is really important to uh, make sure that everybody is seen and heard from. Um, and then it's rolling by right now, but we're also really interested in kind of hearing thoughts about what next. As I said, we know there's work to do, but we're um, feeling really uh, gratified and just really, um, in a way, just surprised uh, by the stories that we've found so far in our collections. So with that, uh, the final, final slide is just our acknowledgement slide. Uh, there's a lot of people who helped with this exhibit, contributed to it. Um, a lot of research that happened, uh, the land acknowledgement we already talked about, all the students' names can be found here. Um, everybody on campus uh, from the Stanford Archaeology Center, Stanford Libraries, very, very helpful. University Archives, super helpful, and the folks who helped us out there as well. Uh, and then um, if anybody is really interested, uh, at the very end, there is a PDF uh, that you can get that has all the research resources that the students use hundreds of citations that go into the behind the scenes of this because we want to make it a scholarly resource, a research resource, as well as a public exhibit um, with all these amazing images and stories. So with that, that is the uh, conclusion of the formal part of our presentation. If you're interested in going to the exhibit online, which is live and public now, and I hope you are, you can take a screenshot of this QR code that'll take you there, um, or uh you know kind of take a screenshot and i don't recommend necessarily trying to type in this url code but we'll be publicizing it on our facebook page um, and through the archaeology center and through our instagram as well so thank you everybody for your attention uh anybody who has any q a that you haven't put in the question uh, and answer area yet please do that and uh veronica if you wouldn't mind helping to moderate the q a with the panelists and myself that would be great Right, so we will open up for questions. If you have a question, please type it into the Q&A module so we don't miss it. As we're waiting uh, for uh, questions from the audience about any of the women, um, other women you haven't heard about, really anything uh, you want to talk about, please do. Uh, but I have a question for our students, actually, and that is uh, if if you had more time or if you could find out kind of one one or two more things about your woman, um, what do you really wish you had been able to figure out about uh, her history, her work, um, anything like that? I'm really kind of interested in the what next because for us, this is the end of the exhibit, um, but we're also doing a digital humanities data project on all 45 women in provenance we have. And so um, we're gonna be continuing this work in the collections, doing research. Again, it's all kind of in progress, doing research on these women and the, their you know, 30 friends 
uh, in our collections um, about all of that. And so any uh, any future directions all of you uh, really wish you had gotten to when you were working with us that we might keep in mind as we're doing more research in the future. I think if I had had more time and more uh, resources, maybe I would have loved to contact the Asian Art Museum because I, I know she worked uh, or she might she may have volunteered. It was a little confusing uh, reading her obituary, but I know she was very active in the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco. And so uh, with more time and resources, I would have loved to like contact them and maybe see if they had any records of like anything she uh, participated in. But just from time constraints from a single quarter <laughs> did not make that possible. <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely. That idea that, um, and, and many of you spoke about it too, that there were these women linked institutions in ways that the institutions don't know we were linked. I certainly learned from all of your research about um, several women who also donated to the Hearst Museum up in Berkeley or donated to AMNH or the ways that their individual archives get distributed uh, is really, uh, really important and takes a lot of a lot of work and a lot of communication to kind of bring those back together again. So yeah, that's a really, um, that's a really good suggestion, Delia, thank you. I think for um, Mrs. Heller, I would want to do um, more detailed research on her work in Peru because that was definitely a destination for her that she always returned to and always spent like copious amounts of time there. So I think I would want to do more research and just see more about like what she was seeing, what she was researching, the people she was interacting with that made her, you know, love going to Peru so much and continuing her work out there. Right, yeah, kind of getting back that that next step back to kind of um, get a little bit more information about uh, the women's um, uh, experiences in those places they travel to, right, the motivations there. Yeah, that's a really good, a really good one too. And then um, as we're maybe hearing from or the, the other students are thinking about this, I also know we've got or at least a couple other students who took the class who are attending right now. I've been peeping the attendees list. So if you folks especially have any questions you want to put in the Q&A, um, we would certainly welcome, welcome those. Yeah, and then I think just to comment on that question that Christina posed, there are a lot of letters that Hanson's roommate from her first trip to Greece wrote back to like her family and all her friends about Hanson and stuff. And I read some of those through somebody else's analysis of them. And I really would have loved to get my hands on those letters and maybe like other collections of things people wrote about this woman uh, to get more of a holistic perception of like, how did she interact with other people? Like who were her friends? Who didn't she like? And get that more personal touch as opposed to like the Stanford obituary and what somebody else said this person said that she said. Right. I guess there's that, right, no matter how much um, information you do have, you, you always want more and different information. So in that sense, everything's always a work in progress, which is a good reminder. Um, but I think that, uh, yeah, those primary sources, there's, there's nothing like those primary um, letters. And I see Regina uh, from the library is Regina Roberts, who worked with our class, too, was asking about letters that came in with the materials. And we did find some sometimes whole, whole letters. Um, uh, really, another uh, real motivation for the exhibit was uh, one of the letters that we got from uh, a woman named Frona Coburn. Um, Frona Smith Waite Coburn, lots of names, a um, couple of, uh, you know, uh, divorces, things like that. Um, so it's about thinking these women like people, but she wrote in her letter um, that she was sure her deceased husband would have been glad to donate all of these baskets to Stanford. Uh, even though as far as we can tell, I mean, they were both interested in donating the baskets, but she was, she herself was very um, active and collected hundreds of baskets. She worked at the 1893 uh, World's Fair in the um, women's exhibit representing California. Uh, she uh, wrote some pretty racist but also very um, deep works about Native Americans. And yet in this letter from her, for example, she mentions her husband. And so the, it's, it's, 
it's things like that. There's just a line in there about it. And the question is, okay, you know, why? Why is she mentioning her husband? How do we learn more about their relationship? Uh, and so we do have a few of those from uh, the collections. And when we do have those, you will see them in the exhibit. There are excerpts and scans, and the students were all over um, all over those as well. Uh, so I would say keep checking the exhibit out for those letters. Uh, and if anybody happens across any more, um, we are always looking looking to find more connections for the women we have. And then we have another question from an anonymous attendee um, who would be interested in knowing how these women were received or how they felt about it. Um, I know that Sydney, you mentioned um, Hilda kind of having insecurities and kind of imposter syndrome about her work. And we know uh, specifically Hazel Hansen with her work as a woman, uh, as a female Stanford faculty member or any of our other panelists, is there anything we can say to that? I mean, it's an interesting question, I'd say, of like the major theme of this exhibit being travel. It seemed like Hansen was much more appreciated in Greece than she necessarily was at Stanford. So in the question of like what motivates travel, maybe it was going out there and like finding a community and finding a place uh, where at least Hansen herself and maybe these other women felt like they were doing, you know, legitimately interesting and important work. Yeah, and also just, you know, to expand more on Mrs. Heller, I think that the people around her definitely received her better than she might have received herself. And I think especially, you know, being married to Edmund Heller, who made a big name for himself already. So I know she was definitely just feeling, she she was probably feeling those feelings of, of overshadowing and stuff like that. But I do think that the people around her did regard her highly, you know, and that was just based off the letters between her and her close um, friend, Watson Davis. So yeah, I think she definitely battled with those insecurities, but I do think that there were people in her circle that knew how um, you know intelligent she was and how worthy she was to continue writing and to continue to share her work with you know the world, pretty much. And then we have yeah, a question. I'm thinking about that, and um, oh, sorry, I was, was going to touch base a little bit on that question with Dahlia, actually, as someone who Right. Um, so Sydney, you're talking about Heller who ended up divorcing her husband and then really like taking charge of her career with some mentorship and support, but kind of finding her own path and her own road. Um, you know, uh, and then Sophie, you're talking about Hazel Hansen having decided at explicitly and telling people, right, we have it from her primary sources that uh, she was um, not going to get married because of what it would do to her career. And so uh, answering those kinds of questions, we've got some information about. But Dahlia, I know your woman um, you know, we're, is coming at us through this marriage. And then Elsa uh, didn't talk about it necessarily, um, but also as she was designing the exhibit, she was doing some parallel research of yet another woman who is not yet in the exhibit, uh, but we're going to be researching more in the future, who was Stanford's uh, first female professor ever in the 1880s, a woman named Mary Sheldon Barnes, who was also married. Um, so she was married and a, and a Stanford professor, but that was not uncomplicated. And so I don't know if Dahlia or Elsa, that idea of um, how do you get, how do you understand or ask these questions like, oh, how, how were their activities received uh, for some of these married women, if there's anything um, you can add to that, or if it's just that, yeah, you, just, you don't know. Uh, Elsa, go right ahead. Yeah, so as you mentioned, I did Mary Sheldon Barnes, who was a professor, an associate professor at history, and she kind of came with her husband. But interestingly enough, because her husband was so much younger than her, they had like a 13 year age difference or something. So they, and they got married when she was in her 30s. So she had already been like an established like historian and professor and known for her like unique teaching methods. And then she married this man and her career kind of pivoted to being like just following this young guy everywhere he goes. Um, interestingly enough, she was received quite well um, on her own merits. Um, and that might have possibly been because of her ties to an academic husband. Um, yeah. 
Uh, for Jean Marshall, it was there was not a lot to go off of. Uh, there was this one giant like interview that her husband did, and she only came up once, and it was only to mention that she had like briefly traveled with him, but it was very. Uh, she was not very. Uh, openly talked about within her life or within the records that were found around her but just based off of uh her obituary it seems that like i would assume that she was uh welcomed into art communities be just because of her like uh frequent involvement in them but a lot of it is just uh presumption and it like it's important to be very open that we don't actually know like just because there's no like there's nothing to go off of <laughs> Right, yeah, and so I can see where you're suggesting maybe if the Asian Art Museum has records of their volunteers or their docents, right? If you look at the history of women in museums, one of the pathways women got into museums was through social activism, education, volunteering. Um, so that is, you know, potentially a means as well. But I think you're also seeing, especially with Marshall, kind of the the trickiness again with the um, the ways that. Uh, sort of how how the memory uh, and social identity of married women is uh, perpetuated and becomes institutionalized through their husbands or through institutions, through volunteering, through whatever it might be. Um, in the last couple of minutes, I just saw uh, another question actually pop up in the Q&A um, that is a very good one. Um, did you find anything that the donor perhaps would not have wanted to be published, some sort of scandal? there are scandals um perhaps and if you had would you have included it in the public exhibit uh very interesting question uh sophie i don't know if you want to start an answer to that because you mentioned a little bit about hazel's relationship with this much older man and the kind of flavor of the records around that yeah sure i mean i think part of the point of this exhibit is to really understand these women and where they were coming from so from you know, like an anthropological perspective, in my opinion, it's important to share these maybe more salacious facts about these women because we're trying to really understand them from a like, you know, fellow person perspective. I think it's pretty easy to take a step back and be like, okay, what's like really bad that we shouldn't include and that we should like leave under the, like if there's, you know, suggestions that this woman like murdered someone, maybe we just like leave that for someone else to pick up some other day. Um, but I think specifically with this dude, Francis Welsh, uh, clearly that relationship had some impact on her perceptions of relationships within academia, within her field, uh, and quite possibly how she perceived, you know, other figures of authority within the archaeological field. And so I think at least mentioning that, you know, this happened, she had presumably a romantic relationship with this man. One of her friends did not like this, said he was old enough to be her father. Uh, this is the facts that we have. And everything else we say is speculation about, you know, maybe this is what, why Hazel wouldn't get married. Maybe this impacted her relationship with the men, male faculty club at Stanford, this, this boys club. You see pictures of her with fellow Stanford faculty and it's like her and then six dudes all around her. Uh, you know, making clear that this is speculation that is founded upon uh, scant primary source evidence, I think is important uh, because in that sense, it's not, you know, we're not trying to make a claim about this woman. We're saying these are the possibilities uh, that are, are here that may have informed this woman's perspective looking forward, that may have informed her curation or her, you know, role at SUAC or at Stanford in general. Uh, you know, also to a certain extent, like her relationship with this dude was somewhat out there. Like her friend was writing about it to her friends back home. So like clearly this friend had no qualm about like airing out Hazel's dirty laundry. Uh, so I think, you know, it really is a case by case basis of like taking that level of analysis and being like, is this fine or is this not? And there are some gray areas, but I more or less you can tell what you know, would maybe be a little embarrassing in the moment, but would, would be fine to be out there for that woman versus what is like really, you know, we shouldn't put that, that out here whatsoever. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I think I'll add to that too, right? As, as Sophie was saying um, earlier, there's, you can never put everything in an exhibit. And so in the exhibit, right, the exhibit is about 
travel privilege, you know, where our collections came from. Um, and so peace, there's a lot of these women's lives and experiences that are gestured towards the exhibit and their activities list maybe, but a lot of details that just kind of didn't make it in there. Um, but things that uh, are more relevant to the question of, you know, how did they position themselves with regard to uh, the people they acquired things from? You know, how did they um, navigate the uh, opportunities that they had? How did they change what people thought women could and should do? Um, all of those kinds of things, that, that's relevant. Um, but they're definitely, uh, if, and another thing is that if we're learning about any of these scandals, um, it's because we are finding them in our research. So uh, we really don't have access to any sources that aren't out there in the archives. Um, but that all being said, it is absolutely uh, one of the questions that we asked ourselves and um, we're struggling with even yesterday uh, was the idea of um, for some of you know the women that are uh, here and then in our collections in general, we have people who um, through their personal relationships were uh, of a sexual identity or gender identity that was not matching the cisgender binary of their age and how much we read into that from our understanding of queer or polyamorous or other uh, kinds of you know broader realities of gender and sexuality that we understand now versus what was understood then how much projection do we do what terms do we use uh, it can be tricky um, and so if you're interested to see how we dealt with it uh, trying to be you know as factual as possible and not projecting our own language onto people in the past or um, pulling some private matters out into the world more than necessary um, i would suggest looking at the exhibit and looking specifically at the mary louise baker section and how we write about her relationship a long-term relationship with a co-worker of hers from a school that she worked at that she eventually bought a house with and that they lived together until um, the end of louise baker's life uh, and so trying to talk about that in a respectful and careful way we are aware of that uh, and it, it can be tricky um, even calling these women women was a debate uh, in a way too. Um, they're self-identified as such, but what does that mean? Uh, so I really appreciate uh, appreciate that question um, and uh, will you know kind of urge folks to look at the exhibit and we're always happy to answer questions that come up from the exhibit. If you want to know more about anything you're seeing there, please go ahead and contact us. Um, I think with that, we're about five minutes over. So I'll sort of officially close the event. Thank you everybody for hanging out with us um, for these extra five minutes, added by, I guess, our technical difficulties. Uh, I'll certainly hang around um, to answer any additional question folks might have. But with that, I would say, have a happy Friday. I see the sun is coming out in Palo Alto and hope anybody who's here for reunion weekend has a really great reunion weekend as well. And thank you to everybody. And thanks very much, especially to all our panelists uh, and to Veronica for helping moderate and also driving the PowerPoint uh, above and beyond expectations. So thank you, everybody. Okay. Please get in touch if you're interested in museums and cultural heritage collections. We want SUAC to be part of your Stanford experience.